how is it that Egyptologists can read hieroglyphics? And they can read it very fluently. Well, the decipherment of hieroglyphics is an interesting story also. There was a French boy, um, Champollion, Francois, I believe, who at the age of eight or nine decided he's going to decipher Egyptian hieroglyphics. Nobody knew how. He just decided that was his goal in life. So he began to study. He studied Hebrew and Greek and Coptic, which is Egyptian, late Egyptian. And he became fluent in these languages. And he studied Egyptian inscriptions, couldn't make head or tail out of them, all these beautiful symbols, until Napoleon invaded Egypt. Napoleon invasion of Egypt was uh, 1799, I believe. And his soldiers discovered this stone in a place called Rashid, which is called the Rosetta Stone, the Rosetta Stone. Now, the Rosetta Stone is fascinating because it has an inscription in Egyptian hieroglyphics followed by an inscription in what we call Egyptian Demotic, a different form of Egyptian, followed by an inscription in Greek. So you read the inscription in Greek, and you think that's the meaning of the Egyptian inscription. And the, uh, the inscription was made during the reign of a Greek king by the name of Ptolemy. After Alexander the Great, all the pharaohs of Egypt were Ptolemies, and most of the queens were Cleopatras. So it was during the reign of Ptolemy and Cleopatra. So Champollion looked at that inscription, noticed that certain groups of symbols were enclosed in an oval called a cartouche. It's an oval, and these names were enclosed. So he decided these may be the royal names. And as he looked at them, he saw that there were certain symbols that appeared in both. Ptolemy, you have P-T-L. Cleopatra, you have K-L-P-T. He began to compare them and reached the conclusion that one of them was Ptolemaeus and the other was Cleopatra. Then he took these symbols and began to apply them to other symbols. And since he already knew the Egyptian language from his study of Coptic, he began to recognize, gradually he began to decipher, and Champollion actually read Egyptian inscriptions, began to read Egyptian inscriptions. He deciphered Egyptian. It was a single-handed operation. And the devotion, you see. He decided, and he did it. And of course, then, once it became clear that Egyptian could be read, and then they began to copy these inscriptions. And, and of course, there's so many books. Uh, there's Gardner's, Gardner's Grammar, Gardner, uh, Alan Gardner published a grammar, Egyptian grammar. And it's so, it's so beautifully arranged. You just, page by page, you study Egyptian grammar by Gardner, you can learn how to read Egyptian. That's so simple, it's so clear. It's a giant volume, but tells you everything. And, um, and then, of course, it became uh, an open knowledge. And then uh, Breasted, uh, you know, as a historian, I think he's a romantic, but as a, um, an Egyptologist uh, linguist, he's a master, he published the ancient records of Egypt royal records of Egypt in five volumes. And that's as complete a record as we have of Egyptian inscriptions in hieroglyphic from all of these, uh, not only the stone inscriptions, but also the uh, papyrus inscriptions. And also hieroglyphic uh, was written in, on stone. It was carved into stone and then written in pen and ink on papyrus. So that's the way Egyptian was deciphered. The Rosetta Stone, of course, is the great bilingual, and that uh, uh, people say, if we can only find the Rosetta Stone for this or that language. And um, another great bilingual was discovered in, um, I believe it was 1950, in Turkey, where this gigantic inscription was found in Phoenician. Because anybody who studies a little bit can read Phoenician. And, and the other side, was in Hittite hieroglyphic, which was a puzzle for a long time. 
and the discoverer decided he's going to take the Phoenician inscription, publish it, and let everybody read it, obviously, to tell them what the contents are. And as soon as it appeared, of course, it appeared, in, I mean, my teacher Cyrus Gordon translated it, uh, Theodore Gaster, another one of my teachers translated it, and uh, it was published in many places because Phoenician is close to Hebrew, and it's a very long inscription. Then, Bossert, the discoverer who was working on Hittite hieroglyph, began to decipher Hittite hieroglyph based on this translation. It's still a job, it's still, a, it's still a tough job, but these are the keys, you know, and you find these keys, it's wonderful. And of course, one of the great aids to the decipherment, to the understanding of the uh, Sumerian language was the fact that many Babylonian dictionaries were written. I'm talking about 1800 BC, 2000, well, 2500 BC, dictionaries, uh, Babylonian, uh, Sumerian, Sumerian, Babylonian. And in uh, Ugarit, they discovered a quadrilingual dictionary, a, st a stone, a clay tablet, four languages in columns, Babylonian, Ugaritic, um, I think it was Hurrian was one of the languages, and Assyrian, or Sumerian, so you have four languages. And there are many dictionaries, but not all of them. You see. We, even the Hurrian, the bit of Hurrian is not enough. It would be nice to discover more. Uh, an interesting point about the Hurrian language, it was the language spoken by the Hurrians who were ruling over certain parts of the Middle East at the time. Uh, there was a king by the name of Dushrata, king of Mitanni. Mitanni was a kingdom on the Euphrates River, the border between what is now Iraq and Syria. Dushrata, king of Mitanni, is known, and he's written letters, but one letter he wrote to Amarna, the capital, could not be understood. He wrote it in Hurrian, not in Babylonian. And so Dushrata's letter, which he wrote in Hurrian, became one of the sources for the decipherment of the Hurrian language, but it's difficult because there's no translation. But the question was, why did he write it in Hurrian, not in Babylonian? Oh, well, that's my theory. He wrote it in Hurrian for the Hurrian ambassador in Egypt, not for anybody else to read, because he knew that the letters came into the chancery. Of course, uh, I'm sure that there were Egyptians who found this letter. I say, well, let's, let's find out what he's saying. And they probably had a scribe or some linguist who could translate it because they were all polyglots. All of these scribal places in the ancient world were polyglot. I mean, they knew, the scribes knew several languages. They had to. <laughs>